Hello everyone, welcome to our podcast. I'm Pravina, the host for today's podcast session. We have two speakers with us today, Moindan and Arvin. Hello guys. Hello. Hello. It's kind of hard to meet you guys nowadays due to COVID. So how are you guys doing? Hello Pravina and Arvin. I'm doing good, yeah. How are you guys doing? Yeah, hello Pravina and Muinton. I'm doing good and nice to meet y'all in this podcast session. Today, our podcast topic will be about inflammation of the uterus. In this podcast session, we will be talking about endometritis, metritis, pyometra, embryonic death, and repeated marriages in detail with our two experts. I'm looking forward to gain a lot of knowledge from you both. So, Muinton, can you explain what endometritis and metritis are? And how are they different? That's a good question, Pravina. Based on my understanding, endometrius is inflammation in the uterine lining. It can affect all layers of the uterus. The uterus is typically aseptic. However, the travels of microbes from the cervix and vagina can lead to inflammation and infection. This condition is usually occur as a result of rupture of membrane during childbirth. Endometriosis, on the other hand, is the most common postpartum infection. Most cases of postpartum endometriosis are polymicrobial, involving aerobic and anaerobic bacteria. Endometriosis results from the travel of normal bacteria flora from the cervix and vagina. The uterus is sterile until the amniotic sac rupture during childbirth, and the bacteria is more likely to colonize uterine tissue that has been devitalized, bleeding or otherwise damaged as during cesarean section. Maybe Arvin, uh, can you add more info about the metritis? Yeah, yes, sure, Muinten. So, uh, metritis is in inflammation of the wall of the uterus. So, it is a postpartum infection of the uterus, and it is uh the inflammation of the uterus consisting of both the endometrial and the muscular layer. So, most of the cases occur during the first 10 to 14 days of delivery, and sometimes it is referred as a uh, toxic purpural metritis of uh, pelvic inflammatory disease. So it is categorized uh, by an enlarged uterus containing a watery red brown fluid to viscous off-white purulent uh, uterine discharge. So which is uh, often has a fetid odor or a very unpleasant smell. Wow, that's a lot of interesting information about metritis and endometritis. I want to share with you a small story about my dog Curly that happened a year ago. She's nine year old toy poodle, and there's one time she had very smelly <clears throat> blood tinge discharge from her vulva area and an uncomfortable firm abdomen. Her temperature was up and she looked miserable. She had been off food, drinking a lot, and she had been sick for a couple of times. And the vet diagnosed her with pyometra. I wasn't aware about the term pyometra. All I knew was it's something life-threatening. So, Mindan, can you share some info about pyometra to our pet owners? At least, you know, they can be aware of this condition unlike me. Sure, Bravina. I hope your dog is currently doing good now. Uh, pyometra is a very common condition in dogs, especially in unspayed dogs. Pyometra is a secondary infection that occurs as a result of hormonal changes in the female reproductive tract. Following interest of heat, the hormone progesterone remains elevated for up to two months and causes the lining of the uterus to thicken in preparation for the pregnancy. If pregnancy does not occur for several consecutive extra cycles, the uterine lining continues to increase in thickness until cysts form within the uterine tissue, a condition called as cystic endometrial hyperplasia. The thick and sighted lining secret fluid that create an, an ideal environment for the bacterial growth. And also basically the cervix is the gateway to the uterus and it remains tightly closed except during estrus and when it relaxes to allow sperm to enter the uterus. If the cervix is open or relaxed, the uh, bacteria that are normally found in the vagina can easily enter the uterus. And if the uterus is normal, the uterine environment uh, prevents bacterial survival. And however, when the uterine wall has become thickened or cystic due to cystic endometrial hyperplasia, perfect conditions uh, exist for bacterial growth. 
Uh, I see. So what are the clinical signs of biometra? Uh, okay, Bernard. the clinical signs depend on whether or not the cervix remain open. If it's open, pus will drain from the uterus to the vagina to the outside. Pus or an abdominal discharge is often seen on the skin or hair under the tail or on bedding and furniture where the dog has recently laid. Fever, lethargy, anorexia, and depression may not be present. Uh, if the cervix is closed, pus that form is not able to drain to the outside. It collects in the uterus, ultimately causing the abdomen to distend. The bacteria release toxins that are absorbed into the bloodstream, and dogs with close perimeter become severely ill very rapidly. They are anorectic, when, uh, very ridiculous, and very depressed. Vomiting or diarrhea may also be present, and toxins released by the bacteria affect the kidney ability to retain fluid. Increased urine production occurs, and many dogs drink in excess amount of water to compensate. Increased water consumption may occur in both open and closed service by America. Okay, so what's the treatment plan for biometra, Alvin? So the preferred treatment is to surgically remove the infected uterus and ovaries by performing an ovarian hysterectomy, also known as P. So dogs are diagnosed in the early stage of the disease and are very good uh, surgical candidates. The surgery is somewhat more complicated than a ro uh, routine spay at this stage. However, most dogs uh, are diagnosed with pyometra when they are quite uh, ill, resulting in a more complicated surgical procedure and a longer period of hospitalization. And intravenous fluids are required to stabilize the dog before and also after the surgery. And antibiotics are usually given for two weeks after the surgery. Thank you guys to, uh, for sharing a lot of information about biometra. So now uh, I would like to know more about abortion and embryonic mortality. So Mundan, what's the difference between abortion and embryonic mortality? Okay, I'll give an explanation. Uh, the distinction between these, term, these two terms is related to time after fertilization. Fertilization results in the creation of an embryo, which becomes fetus after 45 days in cattle. Therefore, loss of pregnancy prior to 45 days is termed embryonic mortality. Loss of pregnancy after 45 days is termed as abortion. Early embryonic mortality is trapped with tumors of embryo prior to 16 days post fertilization. This is because the maternal recognition of pregnancy factor, thought to be uh, interferon, is released. Thus, the cow will remain returned to ostrus after a normal ostrus interval. Around three quarter of embryonic loss is during this early period. This is usually unnoticed from a practical point of view. Late embryonic mortality describes the demise of embryo between 16 and 45 days post fertilization. Although only one quarter of embryonic loss is during this period, the proportion which is noticed on farm is much higher as number will be lost after a positive pregnancy. Diagnosis has been given. Uh, abortion describes the loss of the fetus between 45 and 270 days post fertilization. That's a lot of information about abortion and embryonic death. And can I know what is repeated marriage, Arvin? So, Pravina, so I'll be explaining that. So, repeated breeding is a substantial problem in cattle breeding, leading to large economic loss for dairy uh, producer due to more inseminations and also increased calving uh, interval and increased uh, culling rates. So, repeat breeding has been defined as failure to conceive from three or more regularly spayed service in the absence of detectable abnormalities. The need for repeat breeding a return to estrus after a mating or artificial insemination, which is AI, could be caused by either fertilization failure or embryonic death. So numerous studies have led to the conclusion that in female cat, uh, sorry, female cattle with normal fertility in the incident of uh, fertilization uh, failure is approximately 10%, and early embryonic death within three weeks following fertilization accounts for approximately. Ah, that was very clear. So what's the cause of repeated breeding? 
A repetitive breeder is a cattle that is cycled normally with no clinical abnormalities, but has failed to convince after at least two successive insemination. The reason may be genetic, environmental infection, altered ovarian activities. All these etiological factors automatically result in either the failure in fertilization or embryonic death that lead to repeat burden. Based on the general array, uh, the genetic factors such as chromosomal or genetic abnormalities of parent and those defects that occurs during the differentiate process may negatively affect fertility. For example, repeat building uh, has been noticed in calf with chromosomal abnormalities such as translocation 1 uh, over 29 or trisomy X. The uterine infection and repeat oscillatory cycle in which the uterine environment encourages normal embryonic development. Hence, any disorder or defect like uterine infection, endometrial, spermatoid, matrix, etc., adversely affect the survival of the embryo, causing embryonic death, which is also one of the major reasons for repeat breeding. Uterine infection negatively influences the uterine and cervical postmortem involubulation. Follicle development causes embryo motility and repeat estrosory. Furthermore, the reproductive tract of cow offers an appropriate atmosphere for oocyte growth, sperm transport, and fertilization and implantation. Anatomical or functional alteration of this structure can compare gestational failure and repeat breeding. The problem of ovarian cysts in dairy cow is a serious reason for reproduction failure. Cystic ovarian degeneration is a cause of repeat breeding in cattle. Daily ovulation on estrus are also linked with this problem. Local inadequacy resulting in progesterone frequency may provoke repeat breeding syndrome. The nutrition value might be also one of the reasons that affect the repeat breeders. And the treatment should be repeated. Uh, breeders should be carefully evaluated in order to define the most po uh, possible reason for the failure and to convince of failure in pregnancy maintenance. Oh, thank you, Mohinder. That was a lot of information about repeated breeding. And so, Next, uh, let's talk about embryo reabsorption. So, Arvind, can you explain more about embryo reabsorption? Oh, so, uh, embryo re uh, reabsorption is the disintegration and assimilation of uh, one or more fetuses in the uterus at any stage after the completion of organogenesis, which in humans is after the ninth week of gestation. Before organogenesis, the process is called embryo loss. So resorption is more likely to happen early on in the gestation than later on. A death of a fetus is likely to result in a miscarriage. The process of embryo resorption comprised of two, uh, sorry, four stages, which is the first, uh, the conceptious exhibited uh, growth retardation. Second will be bradycardia and pericardial, uh, pericardial edema were observed and third further development ceased the and the embryo died and finally embryo remnants were resorbed by maternal immune cells so in early gestation which is uh, day seven and eight the growth retardation was characterized by a small embryonic cavity the embryo and its membranes were ill defined or did not develop at all and the echo density of the embryonic fluid increased and within one or two days, the embryo and its cavity disappeared and was transformed uh, into echo dense tissue surrounded by fluid filled caverns. In corresponding histologic preparations, fibrinoid material interspeed with uh, maternal granulocytes and lacunae filled with uh, maternal blood were observed. In later stages, which is day nine to day 11, resorption prone uh, embryos were one day behind in their development uh, compared to their normal siblings. Wow, that was a very good explanation. So I guess we are at the end of our podcast discussion. I hope it helps you to understand more about information of interest. Thank you, Mohindan and Arvind for being with us today and to share your knowledge with our listeners. And thank you, guys. Thank you, Pravina. Thank you, Marina.